Welcome to Forbes Straight Talking Cyber. Um, this week we're looking at uh, II 16, which is literally just about to launch. Um, using Hide My Email and what that does for you. Um, talking about what things do for you, we'll be looking at mental health issues in cybersecurity industry. And also, can your keyboard give away what you're typing? So maybe a good place to start would be to look on to next Monday. Um, for those of you who are at a different day of the week to us or watching this at a different time, um, that is Monday the 6th of June, I believe, um, when Apple's doing its WWDC conference, Worldwide Developers Conference. Uh, we're going to see big updates there as we do every year in June. And one of the biggest ones will be iOS 16. So exciting stuff. What are we expecting to see in 16? It's different from... 15.5. Do you know what? I don't know at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> has been kept very silent. <laughs> That's it now. <laughs> End of video. Um, but we do know there's going to be some changes to the interface. So the way it looks, that's not really relevant to us in security and privacy. Um, Apple has been following a really, really kind of strict path over the last couple of years when it comes to iPhone privacy. So we'll expect to see more anti-tracking technology. We'll expect to see more options and more transparency and ability to opt into things rather than simply, you know, having the automatic opt-in. Um, hopefully more on the location side as well. So we're kind of more aware and able to control location tracking because that's one of the big things with them. So, um, so one can assume that Zuckerberg is cowering in his bathroom terrified as to uh, as to the latest apple attack on the meta empire do we know anything about what's what's coming next yeah as he has been for the last year or so and we've just seen this absolute hammering of facebook revenues and 12 billions the latest prediction for the revenue loss that they're going to be having um, over this year so yeah we will expect to see more because as long as you're affecting the mobile advertising world you're affecting facebook directly and facebook's business model so um anti-tracking app tracking transparency has really affected Facebook's revenues, that has been the death to it. And it doesn't affect Google as much as Facebook, does it, as we've discussed before? Yeah, Google runs for everything. But, you know, I mean, you've got to feel a bit sorry for Zuckerberg. Imagine kind of losing that much money just as the cost of living crisis ensues. He'll be, uh, he'll be, he'll be, turning, he'll be turning the lights off and only heating the rooms and the downstairs of his mansion if uh, if this can never sound like this, right? Oh, poor Mark Zuckerberg, everyone feels so sorry for him because he's such a likeable man. <laughs> So go on, tell us about this, um, if we're talking about anti-tracking and privacy, um, hide my email. Yeah, it's my favourite Apple feature. So I'm going to write a how-to guide on how to use it, tips and tricks and stuff like that. One of the reasons that it's my favourite is not just because of the fact that it hides your email address so you're not added to all these lists, you can cancel them off straight away so marketers aren't just contacting you all the time and adding you to these uh, ridiculous um, marketing lists that they have. Um, I like it because it's really good if you want to get online discounts as a new user of the service. Um, I'm quite an avid online shopper, as many people will know, and the discount is usually a one time. I will join the site and you get 20% off the site. And I'm always looking for discounts when I'm buying stuff. And it is important as well, you know, with the cost of living crisis that we are having at the moment, um, especially in the UK with inflation just going to ridiculous levels. Um, so what you can do is you can join using Hide My Email to get this discount. If you want to buy something again from the same site and your um, device, whatever you're using, will come up with the Hide My Email that you've created for it. So that will stop it from happening again. You can actually go in and manage your email addresses. So you can go in, you can delete Hide My Email. You've deleted that address completely. You won't get any of the emails from it, but then you can set up a new one. So this is a good trick to just continually keep changing your email address and using Hide My Email and deleting them so you've not got all this kind of legacy um, of, of emails. So not all bad news for Zuckerberg then. So you can see, well, yeah, earnings and share price might be down at Facebook, but he can now get multiple discounts at Best Buy. So, you know, every cloud, I guess. Exactly. Well, maybe we should move on to some more serious security stuff now that I've done all the uh, fun Apple uh, tricks and tips. 
Davey, um, you've been talking a bit about mental health this week, haven't you? And uh, some stats, I believe. Oh, yeah. Um, by the time everybody sees this, it will be June. Um, we're actually recording this right at the end of May. And May has been Mental Health Awareness Month. And whilst I'm not a fan of these uh, specific days that come out, you know, password day and all the rest of it, this one's important. Um, I mean, it's important to me, it's important to everybody, it's important to me because I do suffer from mental health issues myself. Um, and there was a bit of research that was published um, by a security automation company, an no-code company called Times, who I've never actually heard of, but they surveyed more than a thousand security professionals um, regarding the state of mental health in the industry. And uh, some of the statistics were quite revealing, but there were a few numbers that really struck home with me. Um, that was more than a quarter, I think it was 27% um, said their mental health had declined across this last year. 64% um, said that their mental health um, affects their ability to get their work done properly. And 51% are on prescription medication for mental health issues. I'm one of them. Um, I'm on prescription medication for anxiety and depression. Um, my mental health issues have definitely got worse over the course of this last year. Um, although the core reason for mine uh, may be different to everybody else's, but then I guess that's the same. Everywhere. Um, so I thought it might be an idea to dig a bit deeper into this whole issue. And so I'm going to be talking to people about the impacts of working in cyber on your mental health, specifically working in, in this industry, because it's a, a very demanding industry in terms of time and resource and the pressure that it puts on people. So I'm going to be asking what can be done to better protect our mental health in the industry, what um, vendors are doing, what employers are doing to help protect the mental health of their employees, um, and who people can turn to if they're experiencing issues related to anxiety, depression or burnout. That's interesting, Davey, because the figure is very, very high and something that might be quite surprising to a lot of people. Is it working in the industry itself? Do you think people might be kind of programmed to be quite negative thinkers because you are always looking out for danger? I mean, that's your job in a lot of cases, isn't it? You're always worst case scenario planning. Do you think that affects people's way of thinking and therefore their mental health? Possibly. Um, to be honest, I was surprised it was as low as it was. I would have thought it would have been higher. Um, the, the cyber industry, I mean, it, yeah, when we talk about cyber security um, and the cyber security industry, it's a very broad church. It covers a lot of things, a lot of disciplines. However, what's key and common between them all is that it's a highly pressured industry. Um, everybody's working to ridiculously tight deadlines. It's very time pressured. Um, and Threats change all the time. They're evolving all the time. And the ability to find those threats, um, protect against those threats, communicate about those threats is so important. Everything has to be so precise. Um, that pressure really, really builds on people. There's a, there seems to be a pressure in the industry as well that people have to work stupidly long hours. Um, to be able to achieve this and it's expected of them and if they don't then they're somehow failing or they're not worthy and um, I think it's a, a, an industry it's not alone in suffering from mental health issues but I think there are a number of things that make it very prone to it. Definitely and it's that burnout thing as well isn't it I mean you feel pressured you just keep working 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 and then you make yourself ill physically mentally or, or sometimes both and people need to get that kind of work-life balance but that's easier said than done because you know for us we're freelance so like we have to do the work no matter when we do it we take on the work it has to get done no matter what happens and that pressure can be very difficult too. Yeah, yeah. Also the, um... Sorry go on with that. The um, I think mental health, writ large at the moment, given lockdowns, you know, family circumstances, cost of living crisis, I think there is clearly a mental health crisis across all sectors right now. You see it everywhere. And I completely understand that some of that success space within the cyber industry, and, and there's been a focus on that for a little while now, which is really good. But you kind of just do get the sense that, you know, what, you know, 
everyone's got a bit of PTSD after the last couple of years in terms of just this unprecedented what everyone's been dealing with and, and, and that hasn't gone away and it's almost like every time you think you've got through one thing and then you get hit with something else so right now you know you've got what's going on in Ukraine you've got inflation running right in, interest rates going up cost of living crisis etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's just going to be really interesting to see how how society copes with with this Moving on to a slightly different subject um as everybody knows uh, one of my main interests is hacking particularly like hardware hacking and i like to um be on top of um the more um surreal threats uh to what we're doing um one that is quite surreal is um, the question of can the sound of your keyboard reveal what you're typing now i'm a professional writer that's my job i'm bashing a keyboard for probably 75 percent of my working day um so it's unsurprising that i'm also a mechanical keyboard user um i've been using mechanical keyboards for probably the last 15 20 years um so when over the last few weeks, um, numerous publications have run stories about a, a new threat that can tell what you're typing by the audio of your clicky keyboard. Um, I'm all ears, if you'll excuse the pun. So let's have a look. Um, what is the threat? Well, it's a security researcher who's been exploring the viability of, of um, the way you type the audio from when you type um, for a while now. He's not alone in doing this. Um, over the last 10 years or more, there have been people looking at whether you can determine what's being typed by the sound of the typing. But this guy's come up with his latest incarnation of the research and it's called KeyTap. This is KeyTap 3. And that's led to the reports that I'm talking about. Um, it has a website where you can try it out for yourself. So assuming you're typing in English language and you don't type too quickly, there's a couple of red flags for you already. Um, it works, supposedly. Um, this is an oversimplification, oversimplification. Um, by analyzing the frequency of n-grams, which uh, an n-gram is like a, a contiguous sequence of items from a given sample, um, in the audio clusters that it recalls. Um, I played along with this, and the result was exactly as I would have expected, given that the software analyzing the audio of my, my typing didn't know the keyboard that I was using, and I don't mean just the model, but I mean the model and the particular set of keys that I'm using because mechanical keyboards, you can change the keys that you're using. So you can go for ones that are quiet, you can go for ones that are noisy, um, and it depends on how they interact with the, the, the keys. There's some that have a better bounce back, some that um, actually click um, much sooner than others so you don't have to depress them as far. Um, and this software, this experiment can't, pre-analyze it hasn't been trained on every single variety of keyboard and key that there there is out there nor indeed on on my individual typing style or the microphone that i'm using for example which is what it needs to pick up the, the sound in the first place um and it was gobbledygook there was nothing that was remotely resembling what i'd typed in the results so i've been in touch with the researcher uh, and I've interviewed him about um, his experiment and why my interactions with it have failed. Um, and you can read all about that in, in, in my article. Um, but the takeaway is that I don't think that there's much to worry about with this, like most lab-based um, threat experiments, threat research. It's fine in the lab where everything's tightly controlled, but out in the real world, there's so many variables that it makes it very difficult to repeat. And to be honest, there's a lot of a lot, lot, lot more easier ways um, to see what you're typing on a keyboard than trying to grab into a, a microphone or get a microphone close to a keyboard and analyze the sound. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we see a lot of kind of this research that comes out and a lot of people write about it and it can get overblown to the point of, well, it's proof of concept, so it must be able to happen in the real world. And it's really great that you've tested it because it just completely proves that people shouldn't worry about every single thing that they read. And it's about kind of working out which threats affect you, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's research. This is this is research and, and research is important and it's fascinating um, because 
what quite often happens is that the, the, the threats that are being researched in their entirety, they never really come out to be something that's a, a risk to people in the real world. However, parts of that research are. So somebody will take one aspect of some research and they'll move that into a slightly different arena. And then it does become a real world thing. So I think it's important that researchers continue to look at the potential ways that people could attack us. Um, but it's also important that we just don't get tied up in the hyperbole about it and, and, and think, oh, well, the, the world's falling. Mm -hmm.